Lord, what a delight it is to be here this afternoon and just to be with people who love Christ and thank you that we have this place and that we can meet together and that we not only love Christ, but we come here to worship you. Thank you for your word and uh, just pray that today as we look at John chapter 9 that it would encourage us all, Lord, as we see again the incredible power of Jesus Christ be displayed. So Lord, uh, guide us now, prepare our hearts and our minds, and we thank you now in Jesus' name, amen. So as uh, you know, those who are regular, we are going through the Gospel of John right now, and today we have arrived at John chapter 9, and I've entitled this sermon, The Healing of the Man Born Blind. The Healing of the Man Born Blind. Maybe you're familiar with the story, it's a great story, and uh, I hope we'll be able to draw some really applicable, uh, some applications that are very applicable to our lives. So that was the intro, actually, if we're doing the points. So number two is, well, let's just go right into the context. Usually I read the text before we study it, but today it's going to be so long, I'd like to just read it as we go through it. But just a word on the context, okay? Now, for those of you who have been with us, you may remember that in John 8 and verse 12, Jesus declared this. This is how the whole thing starts. I am the light of the world. Jesus says that. And uh, this claim spawned a lengthy debate between Jesus and the Jews, you may remember, when they ask him, they basically ask him seven questions to try and trap him as an imposter. And we looked at those at our previous times together. The debate ends in chapter 8, verse 58, when Jesus affirms his deity by not only saying that he was alive before Abraham was, but by claiming that he, Jesus, was the I am of the Old Testament, thereby declaring himself to be God. The result is immediate in verse 59. Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus himself uh, hid hid himself and went out of the temple. So the, 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 the result is immediate. They want to stone him. They want to kill him. And we've known from day one that that is what they wanted to do but he was able to escape. So this brings us now to chapter 9, verse 1, of this amazing story of the healing of the man born blind. And the story begins with Jesus and the disciples coming out of the temple, and they see this blind man begging. So in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. So that's pretty intriguing. Now the disciples were used to this scene. But seeing this man that was blind, this brings up a question, and that's point three here. It's the question. What is the question that this brings out? Well, in verse one, or is is two, you could say, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Now, the fact that this man was born blind or blind from birth is an important detail because it means that he had no hope. Imagine being born blind in that age. In those days, there were no state-run social services for those persons. The only thing a person like that could do, really, to sustain themselves was to beg or depend, of course, on their family. Now, having said that, The Old Testament does have a type of social system. Actually, Proverbs 19.17 says, He who is gracious to the poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. So begging was in a way respected because it was really the only way poor people and the lame could be helped. Note also that this blind beggar has found a strategic place to beg at the entrance and exit of the temple. You can imagine the traffic. I mean, if you've been to Jerusalem, you can see where those big temple steps are. I mean, thousands of people would go up and down. And so there he is strategically located to see the maximum amount of people that would be able to help him financially, which also implies that he was probably well-known in town. He was born blind, probably been there many, many years, like the man in Acts chapter 3, well-known blind beggar. Then it says, and his disciples asked him in verse 2, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? That's an interesting question, right? In those days, when someone was born lame, or in this, ki- in this case, blind, two reasons were often put forward as to why God would have allowed them to be born this way. The first potential reason 
The person was lame because he must have sinned in his mother's womb. This is what the Jews said. The Jews believed that the soul existed before it became a person at birth and that that soul could sin prior to birth. Ezekiel 18.4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. So they believed that souls could sin specifically prior to birth. Now, we would say that, you know, all children are conceived in sin. We'll come back to that in a minute. But they said there's a specific sin that you could have done prior to birth that could cause the problem. The second thing that they sometimes would propose is that the person was lame because his parents sinned. Because his parents sinned. In Exodus 20 and verse 5, we read, I, the Lord, your God, visit the iniquities of the father on the children on the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. In other words, you are lame or you are blind or whatever your problem is because your parents sinned. That's what they would say. Now, this raises the question of where our infirmities come from. Why do we fall sick? Why are some people born handicapped? I'm sure you've had this question. We've all wondered about that. When you're in front of a very handicapped person, you just feel horrible and you kind of wonder why. Why them and not me? I mean, we, we have all asked those questions. Well, the Bible teaches that our infirmities are actually a result of sin that was passed down to us from Adam. In Romans 5.12, it couldn't be clearer Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. You remember the story in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve sinned against God in the Garden of Eden. The result was that God cursed man and the world because of that sin. Actually, death and the sickness eventually that, that leads to death became part of the human experience. In Genesis 3.3, we read, um, because but God says to the woman and to the man, he says, well, to the woman, you shall not eat from this tree or touch it lest you die. Lest you die. So death came by the sin of Adam and Eve, and sickness is part of the human experience, and that leads always, ultimately, to death. I mean, we, we die because something goes wrong with our body as we get older, and so that is part of the human condition. Humanity, at that point, was instantly plunged into evil, and since then, men, animals, and even nature have suffered terrible consequences of that sin. For example, back in Genesis chapter 3, and verse 16, we read... On the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you shall bring forth your children. That is one of the consequences when ladies, I, I have obviously never experienced this, okay? <laughs> Praise the Lord, I could say, uh, you know. But I mean, I know my wife has had three children, and the, the pain at childbirth that you experienced, which apparently she said is worse than a toothache, okay? Um, I mean, like, a, it, it's, it's bad. That is all part of the curse, it's all part of the curse. Now, man doesn't get a free ride here. In chapter 3, verse 17 of Genesis to Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Curse it is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it in all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, etc. And you shall work by the sweat of your brow. In fact, tomorrow when you go to work, and by about tomorrow, 10 a.m., when you're sick of it, okay? And you're going, I don't like work. I'm sick of it. Well, if you ever have had those thoughts, guess what? Right here at Genesis 3, your work has been cursed, actually. That's why work in and of itself does not fulfill a life, because it's been cursed. Work is great, brings a lot of satisfaction, but in and of itself is not the final answer to everything. But not only that. Not only men and women were cursed, but in Romans 8, listen to this. This is amazing. Romans 8, verse 18 says, 
Uh, well, let's go with verse 19. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for, the, rele- for the, the revealing of the Son of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it. That the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. What we learn here, Genesis 3 and Romans 8, is that even creation was cursed. So all of this is to show that sickness that we have, from the common cold to cancer to a, a horrible physical handicap, are ultimately a result of the fall. Now, it's true that certain misfortunes can happen to us because of our sin, willful sin. Drunk driving is an example. Um, I mean, you can make a stupid choice, drive drunk, and cripple yourself through an accident or someone else. Even Christians are not um, spared stupidity sometimes. 1 Corinthians 11.30 says that a Christian who takes the Lord's Supper unworthily Well, it says that some in the Corinthian church became weak, others became sick, and others even died because they took communion unworthily. So we can do stupid things that can bring that curse on us in a more rapid way. Now, for Christians, there is an encouragement to all that bad news. Because for a Christian, he perceives infirmity differently than the world does. Because the Christian knows that God is mysteriously sovereign even over our sickness and disability. This is a very interesting verse, okay? I've thought a lot about this one. This is Exodus 4.11. Listen to this. This is very, very important in light of our story today. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him dumb? That means he can't speak. Or deaf? Or seeing? or blind. Who gives us sight and who makes us blind? Answer, is it not I, the Lord? Is it not I, the Lord? See, this is why 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says that we are to give thanks for all things for those who are in Christ Jesus because we understand that over all of this, even tragedy, God is somehow sovereign. He is sovereign. He is sovereign. Could he have prevented someone from tragedy? Yes. Did he not? No. Okay, so is God sovereign? Yes. So that's kind of a long answer to the question, or at least a beginning of an answer to the question of the disciples back in chapter 9 of John and verse 2. Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he should be born blind. That's the question. Well, verse 3, Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. Sorry, I'm applying the sermon. I've got a little cold, okay, (laughs) because of the fall. (sighs) The fall, the biblical fall and the fall weather, okay, so it all kind of works very well, but now I've got Kleenex in my pocket, so that helps. So, how does Jesus answer the question? Well, he doesn't actually really answer it. Verse 3, Jesus answered, It was neither this man's sin nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. So he's saying in his case, it's not that his soul sinned. It's not his fault that he was born blind. And it was not also because of his parents. No. But it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. In him. Jesus answers by, the, by saying that this man's illness is allowed for God to manifest his glory. Now you're going, wait a minute, how does that work? How can you glorify God if you're blind? I mean, if you have a, a tragic, you know, infirmity of that kind, I mean, how do you glorify God? It's easier to glorify God if I can see, it seems. Well, there's two ways. There's two ways you could glorify God. Let's, say, let's take this blind man as, a, as an example. For example, when a person is miraculously healed, this gives glory to God. 
If a man who is blind is healed by God, you go, wow, God is great. You glorify God. But what happens when a person is not physically healed by God? Though people pray to be healed all the time, right? But God does not heal everybody. Well, you glorify God in that case by blessing the Lord in that infirmity, and this too gives glory to God. And you remember the story, don't you, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, because, Paul says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. A lot of ideas of what that could be, but Paul says I had a problem. Thorn in the flesh a messenger of Satan to buffet me. So this is linked to Satan to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times. I prayed to God three times that he might depart me. Lord, please heal me. Take this problem away. And he said to me, no. <laughs> I love it. No. He doesn't say no. I added no. But he says, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with my weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, etc. Because when I am weak, then I am strong. And the best example of this is Job, probably. In verse, chapter 1, verse 20, after all of those horrible things that happened to him, Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. So that's how you glorify God. You glorify God if you're healed, and you glorify God by praising the Lord in the infirmity, knowing that God is sovereign over that infirmity. Well, now, we can pick up the story with that background. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, Jesus says, We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no man can do work. Here, Jesus says to his disciples, Stop speculating about the nature of this man's sin, who could have caused the illness. Instead, let's take action, come up with solutions, because I won't be with you, be with you for much longer. In verse 5, while I was in the world, I am the light of the world. He says, I'm still here, guys. I am the light of the world. Let's act accordingly. So let's apply this to the blind man. And that leads to point four, the miracle. The miracle. Verse 6. So when he had said this, Jesus does something very strange. It's the only time he ever does this in the Bible. He spits on the ground makes clay of the spittle, applies the clay to the blind eyes of this man, says to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. And so he went away and washed, and he came back seeing. I've often wondered at what instant did the miracle actually take place? Probably at the moment he took that water from the pool of Siloam and, and, and washed his eyes. Out of the 53 miracles Jesus performed in the New Testament, this is the only one where he applies mud to the blind man's eye. Why? I'm sure you've wondered about that. Why did he do that? Why, why, why on this case did he apply mud? He made mud with a spittle and then put it on the blind man's eyes. Why did he do that? Well, we could say that it, was, it wasn't a medical ointment. It wasn't like medicine that, that we can rule out. It's probably to test the Jews about doing miracles on the Sabbath. Because they considered making mud, and we'll see this in a minute, making mud and healing the man on the Sabbath a sin. Really? They, they really wondered if that was a sin? Yes. Look at verse 14. Now it was the Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened the eyes. In verses 16, therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. So perhaps you weren't aware of this, but making mud with saliva and dirt and healing the man 
according to the Jews, very important what I'm saying, according to the Jews, according to the rabbinical laws concerning the Sabbath was a violation of the Sabbath. And this is what infuriated the Jews. For them, making mud or healing a man was not a man who was not in mortal danger on the Sabbath. I mean, if someone was in mortal danger, then you could help him. But if he's not in mortal danger, the Sabbath took precedent over everything. And therefore, it was forbidden. So did Jesus actually violate the Sabbath? That's a really important question. Because Exodus tells us that violating the Sabbath was a pretty serious problem. Exodus 31, 15, we read, For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, holy of the Lord. Whoever does not any work, whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. So the Bible does say that in the Old Testament, if you worked on the Sabbath, you would die. You, would, you needed to be put to death. Now, Jesus, we know, never sinned. In John 8, 46, he says to the Jews, who convicts me of sin? Nobody could. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says that he had no sin, zero, because he was God in human flesh. Therefore, we know that Jesus never once violated the law of Moses, including the Ten Commandments. So what is Jesus refusing to do here? He's refusing to follow human traditions of the religious Jews that they added to the Sabbath law. So let's understand the motivation. This is super important, okay? The law says that you must not work on the Sabbath. We just read it. Okay, so what does it mean to work? Well, they took it upon themselves to define for the people what is considered work and what is not considered work. And since breaking the law of the Sabbath could mean death, technically they were trying to avoid people from dying by defining what they could and could not do. The problem, it became so detailed and so nonsensical that no one could follow the laws anymore. Making mud and creating two new eyes in a blind person is violating the Sabbath that God, I mean, created and punishable by death for healing someone? I mean, no logical, normal person would conclude that. But the Talmud, a Jewish book of regulations, says that healing a sick man on the Sabbath is forbidden unless it's to save a life. So they were just finding this pretext to get Jesus here. So it sounds like Jesus deliberately made that mud on the Sabbath and healed those eyes for that, for that discussion to take place. That's why they're so angry with him. So this leads to four reactions. Four reactions. Okay? And these four reactions are, here they are, the reaction of his neighbors, the blind man's neighbors, the reaction of the Jews, the reaction of his parents, and the reaction of the blind man. Look at verse 8, the reaction of his neighbors. The neighbor is therefore, now, okay, he just got healed. This is the reaction, right? He just goes to the pool of Siloam, gets healed, comes back seeing. Guy's been here for like his whole life, begging. Suddenly he's there seeing with two eyes. The neighbors, therefore, and those who had previously seen him as a beggar were saying, is this not the one who used to sit and beg? You know, I can imagine, if you've seen a blind man before, having two new eyes must completely change the, the, the physiognomy of that person or the, the look of that person. So they're going, wait a minute, you're the blind guy, but What's the deal here? You got eyes? Wait, you're, you're supposed to be blind. I mean, I can really understand the confusion here. So they're wondering, what, what, what's going on? Verse 9, others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he is like him. He came saying, no, but I am the one. I am the one. Wait a minute, I can't really believe that that's you. Verse 10, therefore they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? If that's you, how did this happen? Verse 11, he answered, The man who had called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed, and I received sight. Okay, folks, you know what a testimony is? You know, when you would when, when say, Learn to give your testimony. This is it. He's just telling the facts. He's saying, 
Folks, you want to know what happened? Okay, I'll tell you exactly what happened. It's very simple. The man who was called Jesus, he'd never seen Jesus yet, made clay, he anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam, wash. So I went away and washed and I received the sight. That's a testimony. Testimony of your conversion is, you know what? I was doing so-and-so. Someone explained the gospel to me. I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and my life changed. That's your testimony. Wonderful testimony. Verse 12, and they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. He had never seen him before. He, he went to the pool of Siloam and didn't see Jesus after he went to the pool of Siloam to wash. So the situation is so extraordinary, inexplicable that these people think, okay, we, we better go ask the Jewish leaders what's going on here. So, number two, the reaction of the Jews. Verse 13. So they brought, they brought to the Pharisees him who was formerly blind. So they take this guy, take him to the Jews, to the Pharisees, um, and verse 14, now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and he opened the eyes. What a sad verse. <laughs> because who cares ultimately if it's a Sabbath or not? I mean, this guy was just healed. But as I already noticed, <laughs> for the Jews, this was a real problem. Verse 15, again, therefore, the Pharisees were also asking him, how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and washed, and I see. He says exactly the same thing, same testimony. Verse 16, therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. This man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath? That's false. He doesn't keep their human rules. No, no. No, no. They were, they were wrong about that. And therefore, in verse 17, they questioned the blind man, asked him what he thinks of Jesus. And they said, therefore, to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. He must be a prophet. Verse 18, the Jews therefore did not believe it of him that he had been blind. So they said, no. This, this did not happen. You, you, you did not get it. There's just no way. Now they didn't believe him and that he'd receive sight until they called the parents of their very one who had received their sight. So that leads to the third reaction. The parents. Okay. Since we can't seem to get a clear answer from him, well, it's a clear answer, but we don't believe it, or from the Jews. <clears throat> let, let, or the Jews are confused, so let, let's call in the parents here. So, back in verse 18b called the parents, the very one who had received his sight, and questioned them, saying, so now they're questioning the parents, verse 19, is this your son, who you say was born blind? Then how does he see now? You're the parents. You're saying he was blind. What happened? His parents answered and said, we know that our son is our son, and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him, he is of age, he shall speak for himself. Now, verse 22 is really important, look. <clears throat> his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. So what we learn is the parents were very prudent in the way they answered. They just, again, gave the facts. We know this is our son. We know he's now well. We don't know how it happened. Because they knew that if they believed that Jesus was the Christ and the Jews found out about him, they would be put out of the synagogue. Now that was a huge problem. Because it's not like today, you know, in Geneva, if you were put out of a church or a synagogue, well, there's a lot of other churches you could go to. In those days, if you're in a small village, there's one synagogue. Everyone knows everyone. This is your small villages. If you're outcast of the synagogue, you are toast. You are done. Business relationships, I mean, you're the outcast. Your, your whole world could just, could just revolve in just one day. I mean, that exclusion could be catastrophic for your business, for your friendships, for your family, for everybody. 
So that was a very scary thing to potentially have happen to you. Now they knew it was Jesus who had healed him. Verse 22 seems to imply that, but they didn't dare say it. So they're intimidated. Verse 23, for this reason, his parents said to him, he is of age, ask him. That was, that was a good answer. Hey, look, he's, a, he's of age. He's old enough. You don't need to have to ask. Just ask him. So now they, get, they basically say, okay. So now the dialogue, verse 24, starts with the blind man. So a second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. So give glory to God. Well, what's that all about? They asked the blind man to give glory to God. This was, in fact, a way of asking the blind man to withdraw his false testimony and thus give glory to God by telling the truth, according to them. Shocking is that they were telling him, hey, give glory to God, while they are plotting the murder of Jesus at the same time. Complete hypocrites here. They say, we know this man's a sinner, talking about Jesus. Well, that's weird, because in 846, Jesus had already said to them, which one of you convicts me of sin? Nobody. So, they, they haven't found one sin in Jesus yet, and yet they say he's a sinner. Interesting, isn't it? So verse 25, he therefore answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that I was blind and now I see. <laughs> I, I, that's what we all love this guy. Super clear. I, I don't know anything about this guy, Jesus. All I can tell you is what happened. He opened my eyes. He opened my eyes. Verse 26, they said, therefore, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Verse 27 is an amazing verse. He answered, I told you already. And you did not listen. So who's teaching who here? <laughs> this blind guy with no theology is teaching the, the Jews. I, I told you already. You did not listen. Why do you want to hear again? Here it is. You do not want to become his disciple too, do you? It's like, ooh, boom. You know, just get him right there in the side of the gut. I love it. You don't want to become his disciple, do you? Also, implying that he's already his disciple of Jesus Christ. Brilliant. In verse 29, we know that God has spoken to Moses. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 28. And they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. See, the idea that the blind beggar would dare suggest that they were now eager to follow Jesus was more than their pride could take. So they reviled him. They insult him. That's usually what you do when you don't, want to, when you don't, when you don't know what to answer. You, you, you insult. So they say to the blind man, you're his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. There's another way of saying that. We are the people of the book who follow the ways of the Old Testament. In other words, we don't know this Jesus. You follow him but we don't because we follow Moses. You follow a false prophet. Well, they'd forgotten apparently what John, uh, Jesus had said in 539 about Moses. In 539, you remember this? You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that bear witness of me. Jesus says, the Old Testament talks about me. You are unwilling to come to me that you might have life. Then he says in verse 45, do not think that I will accuse you of my father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you had believed in Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. <laughs> it's like, wow. He says, Moses will accuse you one day. So verse 30, the man answered and said to them, well, here is an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. I mean, what do you say to that? Verse 31, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears them. Okay with your argument that God does not hear a sinner, one who persists in his sin, but someone who does his will, God hears him and he is heard. 
Verse 32, since the beginning of time, he says, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. This is the first blind person miracle having his eyes open ever. This is it right here. Verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Excuse me. <sighs> if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So, the conclusion is that Jesus is who he says he is. He's the son of God since he performed the miracle. That means God heard him, which means he didn't sin as you claim. Verse 34, they answered and said to him, you were born entirely of your sins and you are teaching us? And they put him out. So they're just like really mad with this guy. They put him out. They drove him out. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had put him out. And finding him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? So this is super interesting. Who goes and finds who here? This guy has not seen Jesus yet. But Jesus hears about all this and goes and finds him. And he says to him in verse 35, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, and who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And here it is. He worshipped him. He worshipped him. You know, I think this is, this is the true sign of a true believer. You want to worship him. Probably where he got saved right here, got converted. He worships him. In verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who, may, who see may become blind. He says, I came into the world for judgment. Well, its purpose is to offer life, but those who refuse it, judgment is inescapable. My primary purpose is actually to bring salvation. He uses his mind's blindness to underline the spiritual truth. I have come so that those who do not see, in other words, those who do not understand the truth may see it, that those who see, those who think they see like the Jews, but in fact are blind, may become blind. Verse 40, those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, we are not blind too, are we? So, some of the Pharisees are concerned about their own relationship. In verse 41, Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin, but since you say we see, your sin remains. If you were blind, if you had admitted your error and repented as spiritual blind, then you would have no sin. You would have been forgiven. But the Pharisees and scribes were more like the person Solomon described in Proverbs 26, 12. If you see a man, he thinks himself wise. He has more hope. There is more hope for a fool than for himself. They thought they were wise, the Jews, and they completely missed the boat. So that's the story. How do we end? Just a couple of three lessons. Number one. You must ask the question, who is Jesus? You have to ask that question. I mean, who is this guy that can open the eyes of the blind? Number two, think we can understand why we get sick? Part of the fallen world. Death awaits us because we're in a fallen world. Are you ready? Are you ready to die? To meet the Savior or meet judgment? If you are ill, and we all are, some way or another, can you glorify God in your illness if God has not healed you? That's a really important question. Very interesting point here. How many blind men did Jesus heal that day? Probably just one. Were there other blind men in town? Yeah. Were there other lame and crippled? Yeah. Did he heal them all? No. Healed one. Healed one. Not all. 
Not all the sick people in the New Testament were healed by Jesus. Healing was neither the norm nor for everyone, despite what is claimed by some evangelical circles today. God doesn't owe me health. God doesn't owe me wealth. God owes me one thing, hell, but he's provided a way out of it through Jesus Christ. So we need to learn to glorify God in our illness. And then we see the power of a simple testimony. Lord, thank you so much for this amazing story. Lord, um, what a powerful reminder of who you are. And Lord, thank you that though this was a physical miracle, you've done an actual spiritual miracle in all of our lives. Those who know Christ, Lord, you've given us brand new hearts that we might be able to understand, see, and worship the Son of God. Lord, we thank you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.